The Lord, this, this word that God has for us this morning is a right now word. Yes. Praise God. I don't, I'm not saying I'm going to deliver it great, but I need you to know that the word of the Lord is great. Amen. And it's a right now word that he has for this church. But I don't think it's just for this local body. I, I, I feel like this is what the spirit of God is saying to the churches. Uh, and, and that he that has ears to hear, let him hear. That the Lord is calling his bride and he wants us, amen, to respond. Praise God. All right. So let's go ahead and get into the word of the Lord this morning. Well, look, so just, just Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Lord, for sending your presence in this place. Lord, I know that the presence of the Holy Spirit is in each and every one of us. And we brought you here with us today. But Holy Spirit, you surely showed up and you have spoken to our hearts. Oh, Lord God. And I pray that you would continue to minister, Lord, because you see our lives. You see where each and every one of us are, Lord. And some of us may be in a valley right now. Oh, Lord God. Many of us may be in a valley, Lord. And part of that word was that you are the lily in the midst of our valley, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that, that that lily would bloom, Lord, in our hearts and in our minds. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to do the work that only you can do. Only you can call, baptize the heart of Jesus on the inside of our hearts. And so right now, I'm just asking, declaring and decreeing over this body, over myself, that, Lord, that's what you would do, that you would baptize your heart of love on the inside of us and that we would respond to you, Lord, when you move upon us, Lord God, I pray that we would respond in the way that you're calling us to respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what I wanted to say this morning is that, uh, just kind of getting started with a little intro, is that God's love pursues his people. That's the title of my, my message this morning, in pursuit of his love. And while it seems as though I may be trying to say that we're in pursuit of his love, it's really a play on words because the idea is, is that the Lord is in pursuit of the love of his life. He's in pursuit of you, his bride. Amen. And, and the, the in both the Old and the New Testaments, we could hear the repeated thing, right, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm telling you, like, if you just turn through the pages of scripture and you took the time to read and to see the heart of the Lord, you would see that repeatedly spoken time and again. And so God's pursuing his people. Amen. And, and when I want to understand God's love, then you know what I do? I look to Jesus. Amen. I look to Jesus because he is the visible representation of God on earth. And so when I look at the way that he handled his life and handled his business, I consider how he uh, 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 responded. And then the final act of the cross shows us the love that he had, that his love was sacrificial in nature that he gave. Amen. Uh, the scripture also, I also think about this, that he came to his own, but his own received him not. On the way, Jesus told them, tonight, all of you will desert me whenever he was going, getting ready to go to the cross. And for the scripture says, God will, that, that the, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He said, all of you tonight will be, will desert me. Some of the other translations use the word, uh, you will be offended tonight. So another translation says, you will all fall away tonight. And you know, I want to just sit there just for a second and talk about offenses. And I want to talk about the fact that offenses in our lives can cause bitterness in our hearts. And can cause us to become hardened towards the things of God. And can really begin to cripple us if we're not aware of that. Uh, I want you to know it could be something that took place in your childhood. It could be something that takes place in the midst of the church. It could be something that happens in the workplace. But, but you got to understand the word of God says it's not good to be easily offended. And, and as we move forward, I want you to know that we have to be very mindful of that. But the first thing that sticks out specifically about the, God's love revealed through Jesus is that he just kept on loving. <laughs> Amen. He just kept on. You know, if anybody ever had a right to be bitter, to be offended, to feel rejection, to have unforgiveness, in my opinion, it was Jesus. His own nation rejected him. You know, his own disciples forsook him. He did not come to reveal earthly wisdom, which is sensual and devilish. He came to deliver the wisdom and knowledge of God's love towards us and how his love is to manifest in and through us. Let, let me say that again. 
Jesus did not come to deliver the wisdom of the world to us. The wisdom of the world is devilish and sensual, the word of God says. Jesus came to deliver the wisdom of God's love towards us. And he wants you and I to receive that love and for that love to begin to change us on the inside of our lives. Amen. And, and John 13, 34 and 35, you can put that up for me if you don't mind. That way we can read it together because this is what Jesus said. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. And here you go. Here's a conjunction. If you have loved one to another. I, I, I don't think that we should move from that too quickly. He says this. This is how all men will know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another, you want you, are you, do you consider yourself a disciple of the Lord? Let me just tell you the definition of a disciple. It means to be a learner of Christ. So if you have a desire in your heart to learn Christ, if you have a desire in your heart to allow Jesus to be to be formed in you, the, the scripture talks about it. We recently preached it that Paul says, how I travail until Christ be formed in you. And, and that's what the word of God says, that Jesus and who he is and what he's done is supposed to be formed on the inside of us. Our heart's supposed to beat like his heart. Our mind is supposed to think like his mind. The scripture says that when you get born again, you receive the mind of Christ. Amen. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to have the heart of Christ if we are born again this morning. And that's the question that you have to ask yourself. As you sit in this house or people watching on video, if whether or not you are truly converted to the Lord. And only you and the Holy Spirit can know that. Only the Holy, but the Holy Spirit will speak into your heart because you see, I want to make I want to make this clear. It's not just about praying a prayer. Although praying a prayer is a good thing. It shows that you have a heart towards the Lord. It's not just about accepting Jesus either. It's about repenting of your sin. It's about coming to the recognition that you need a savior, that you were born of Adam, a sinner, and that God the Father had to send Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin and to acknowledge that and say, I need that. That's the medicine I need and not the medicine and the wisdom of the world that's going to supposedly fix me. No, I need what you sent, Lord. I need the cross. I need your life on the inside of me. And when you pray that and when you ask the Lord to forgive you of your sin, you'll know when you're truly converted. And I'll talk about this a lot, but I don't think we can talk about it enough because the Holy Spirit will come live in your heart. Yes. And when the Holy Spirit comes and lives in your heart, he starts changing you. Yes. Amen. Amen. And, and, and he'll start to deal with your heart. Yes. Praise God. Amen. And so, so. I, I want you to know that that he said that he said, if you have love one to another, that's how they will know that you're my disciples. And it's only the Lord that can put that love in us. Amen. Amen. I was praying yesterday uh, in the morning when I got here and I, I and I, the Lord was leading me in my prayer. Now, I know that some people would say, well, I thought the Lord was always supposed to lead you in your prayer. He is. But if we're honest with one another, sometimes the Lord's leading us in our prayer more than at other times. Sometimes we know that we're supposed to pray and the prayers aren't as lively as at other times. But yesterday, it was it, the Holy Spirit was leading me. And I can remember saying, Lord, the reality of your existence and the power of your word becomes so clearly evident on earth when I allow your word and your will to work in me. That's a lot of information right there, a lot of words. So let me say it again for you. Lord, the reality of your existence becomes so clearly evident on this earth when I allow you to have your way in me. Well, what are you talking about? Yes. Because see, whenever I'm bitter, because somebody did me dirty, and I yield to the will of my master, and I realize how bad they treated him, and I surrender to the will of God, understanding that he went to the cross and purchased grace for me. And when I feel all conflicted in my heart and I know that I'm wrong and I surrender to his will 
and I yield to him and, and I let him have his way in me. And then all of a sudden, he does a miracle on the inside of my heart and he changes me in a way that I could not change myself. Lord, your, your, the, the, your work and your will on earth becomes clearly evident in my life whenever I yield to you because the Holy Spirit starts working on the inside of me, transforming me, changing me on the inside and doing things for me that I could not do for myself. But many times people don't yield to the will of the Lord. They would instead prefer to hold on to their hurt. They would instead prefer to hold on to their frustrations, to their irritations, to the, to the offenses that have taken place in their life. I'm sorry, but you don't have any right to do that this morning if you're a born-again child of God. You do not have any rights anymore, my friend. If you have been, you have been the Word of God says you have been purchased by His blood. You are no longer your own. You were bought with a price. You were bought with the price of Jesus Christ. You cannot just live your life any old way that you want to live your life. Not if you're going to be a true child of God. Lord. But yet, we don't want to surrender. So, you know, look, if we talk about pain and heartache and rejection. Some, look, people have been raped before. I, I thought about not putting it in there, but no, I'm going to say it. Because see, people, and, 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 and listen, the world will tell you that if you've been raped, that you have every right to hold on. Listen, you hold on to that pain. You hold on to that bitterness. You hold on to that offense. It will destroy you from the inside out. I'm here to tell you right now, you do, it is not good for you to hold on to that. It is not good for you to try to cover it up and hide it some kind of way. You need to let the Lord of glory have, a, have his work in you. You've been lied to. You've been lied about. You've been cheated on. You've been mistreated. And you've been carrying a spirit of rejection around, with, around on you. But when you come into contact with the truth, of the new covenant when you yield to the truth of God's word that says that Christ is being formed in you through the power of the Holy Spirit and you get out of how Solomon say that get out of your fields yeah, yeah. get out of your fields right get out get away from your feelings and your emotions that you're allowing to get all stirred up on the end because you've been wronged well guess what everybody in the world's been wronged and tomorrow when you wake up you'll probably be wronged again and and you've wronged me and I've wronged you. And if we don't grow up and learn how to release this stuff into the hand of the Lord, we're going to be all bound up. We ain't going to have no oil left in our lamp. We're not going to be able to stand. We're not going to be a house of prayer. We're not going to be a house of praise. We're not going to have any oil. We're going to be all dried up and bitter. And God's life is not going to be produced in our heart. Lord, Lord help us. <laughs> And when you get out of your fields and you let your flesh be crucified Come on. so that the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit can have his way in you, now you begin to receive your healing. That's but the right. longer you delay, the longer I delay, yeah. the longer that process tarries. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians 6, see, I, this, I already had the scripture, I already kind of halfway quoted it. It says this. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Right. Jesus purchased you. It's a heavy price. That, listen, as a pastor, let me say this. I want to say this as I try to have a pastor's heart here. I want you to know how much the Lord loves you. Yes. You know, the value, the value of an object is how much somebody is willing to pay for it. You heard that before, right? And the value of an object is worth what somebody is willing to pay for. I'm here to tell you right now, the Lord purchased you with this blood of his son. The most prized possession that heaven ever held. Jesus, the eternal word, was willing to become flesh so that he could die because the wages of sin is death. And that's the price that he paid to purchase humanity back. And for you and I here this morning in the house of God, we're here because we do. We love God or we want to know God or something stirred us up to bring yeah. us into this place. And what I'm here to tell you is this, is that the Lord's drawn on your heart. He's already spoken to you this morning and he's saying, I'm pursuing my bride and I really want her to turn towards me and to come to me is what he wants you to know. Now listen, I'm going to give you a little illustration. I'm not going to tell the whole story because I'd have to make Danielle 
cut it out of the video and all that. And I've told a couple of y'all something happened to me at the clinic a couple of months ago, and it's kind of like a weird story anyway. But something I was accused of something, and it was a lie. It was a, I mean, it was a bad lie. Okay, let's just put it that way. I was like a really, really bad lie. And and I had been on a four day fast for something else. But it never ceases to amaze me when I go on a fast, I think I'm fasting about one thing and then it turns out that the Lord speaks something else to me, right? Well, anyway, I was approached by the by the office manager and she's like, Matt, I had to tell you this, da 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 and, I'm, and, and I was like, really? Oh. And, and listen, and so, but I had this peace. And look, I don't always have peace when I'm on a fast. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm irritated, right? Because I'm hungry. And, but, but at this moment, I had perfect peace. Hallelujah. Yeah. And I mean, and they were just, and, and, I, and, and look, if any of y'all know me, and some of y'all know me, like when I feel like I'm being accused, right, of something that I don't feel like I did, what do I do? I get very defensive, right? Y'all seen that, didn't you, right? And, 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 and so, so, but I didn't do that. And I just had perfect peace. And I was like, oh, okay. All right, well, that ain't really going to stick. You can't throw that spaghetti to the wall, so praise God. And, and I walked to the, uh, to the water cooler. And I started to get water, and the Holy Spirit started to speak to me. And he said, son, you have been walking around with a spirit of rejection on your life ever since you were a little boy. Because of your relationship with your dad and the fact that you never felt like you could do anything well enough. He, he was like, you need to let me heal you of that. I had a personal counseling session with the Holy Spirit on my way to the water cooler. Amen. And from that day, listen, don't test me. That's not fair for you to test me. But what I want you to know is this, is that from that day till today, it's been getting better every day. It's been getting better every day, the, the defensive response, because I've been preaching for a long time that the Lord is my defender, but at the same time, sometimes I feel like I gotta, I gotta try to defend myself. And another thing that the Lord has shown me, and this will help you out too, is quit going around trying to talk to everybody and get them to agree with you, because half the time, they're not gonna agree with you. And the more you talk about the problems that you have, the more frustrated and defensive you're gonna get. One of the things that the Lord showed me also is, is that you need to learn how to get along with me, son, and you need to learn how to talk to me. Amen. And you bring your concerns and your cares to me and quit talking to other people about it and try to get everybody to agree with you because that's not what you need to do. You need to get, you need, you don't need to please them. Number one, I don't, it's not my job to please you. I put that somewhere in my message and let me just go ahead and release it today. I'm not trying to please you this morning. It's not, oh, look, I'm about to sound rude, but I don't mean it rude. It's full of love. I don't even care if I please you. And, and I know that that might, that might irritate you a little bit. I'm not trying to irritate you. I want to make a point. I want to please the Holy Spirit. So if I say something that you don't like, then what you need to do is you need to first question whether or not it's the possibility that something's going on in you and that you didn't like to hear it. Amen. And so let us please the Holy Spirit. Don't you worry about pleasing me. Let's worry about pleasing the Holy Spirit. And if you and I will please the Holy Spirit and learn how to live like Jesus, amen, and, and look at him as our example, we will so easily please one another. Horizontally, we'll be good. We'll have great horizontal relationships because we will submit to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I need to learn how to really love you, not just say it. I need you to learn how to really love me in spite of all my problems. And I need to learn how to love you in spite of all your problems. Amen. Why? Because you are not your own. You were bought with a price and Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves me. And we need to learn how to love one another. That's how they're going to know that you're truly my disciples indeed. If you love one another. And you can't, pull, you can't do that on your own. You know that. I know that. That's why love is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So there's the illustration. So when people wrong you and offense wants to climb all up in your heart, wants to sit in there and wants to play around with you. It wants to fester like a boil. It wants to irritate you and it will let me, let me say this again, it will have an effect on your life, my friend. And you can sit there and play around with that offense all day long if that's what you want to do. Good luck with that, dude. Because <laughs> it will have an effect. It will have an effect on your countenance. It will have an effect on your behavior. Yeah. It will affect your witness. 
It will affect your worship. It will affect your receiving anything from God. It will affect your horizontal relationships. It will affect your job performance. It will affect every aspect of your life if you allow the devil to get you to hold on to the offenses that have taken place in your life. Let me just say that. I'm a pastor, but I got a little bit of a mouth of a prophet. You need to stop that. We need to stop that. Pastor Matt needs to stop that. Letting an offense embolden a spirit of rejection in our life. Let me say that again. Stop it. <laughs> stop letting a, a, an offense uh, increase yes. that spirit of rejection in your life. Amen. Maybe your daddy was like my daddy and didn't treat you right and said, Nate, but guess what? You, you know, look, 20 something years ago. After the Lord first started getting a hold of me, I'll never forget. I was on the phone with my dad. It's a long story. But he started, like, telling me a, a what for, how the cow eats the cabbage. And he had, I'm sorry, he had the story all wrong. And so at some point in time, by this time, I had a little more boldness. I'm like, well, hold on, hoss. you being led by the devil right now because you can't tell him the truth. And, and, and I said, because I didn't have a conversation with you about this. And anyway, and I said, and this conversation's over. And when I hung up the phone, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, it's about time you learn who your daddy is, boy. Mm, now, I got to tell you, that was 20-something years ago. Right, right. Okay, and I don't think that I've really learned it to the level that the Holy Spirit is wanting me to learn it today. He wants you to understand who your father is. He wants you to understand that Father God loves you and he's proving it. He's proven it by sending his son and the end result of Jesus dying on the cross. Listen to this. This is so important is that grace is released into your life. The person of the Holy Spirit is released into your life and he can form and fashion you into the image of Jesus. He can heal you. He can transform you. He can change your mind. Listen, whatever you're dealing with here this morning, if you're dealing with certain kinds of spirits that are all up in your head, lust and drugs and alcohol, whatever it is, the Lord, that's, that's so easy for the Lord to break that off of you if you will learn to yield and surrender to the cross. And you can cry out to Him and say, Lord, I can't do it. I surrender to Your will. I know You've already done, done it. You said it is finished. And, and, and now there's a release of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I declare over your life freedom and liberty in your heart and in your life through simple faith in Jesus Christ and what he's already done for you at the cross. Lord, Holy Ghost, right now, make it real to your people. Penetrate their hearts and let them receive the grace and the power that you purchased for them. Oh, Lord, have your way. I put in here, let the Holy Spirit heal you and let the cross kill you. <laughs> Amen. Let the Holy Spirit heal you and let the cross kill you because see, it's your flesh. It's my flesh. It's myself that gets in the way of our healing. I, I can see him hanging there on with his body torn. He's naked. He's alone. His people help put him there. They scoff at him. His disciples forsake him. My sin, not your sin, not his sin because he had no sin. My sin caused the father's face to turn from him. He, he, you know, they, whenever God the Father looked upon him and turned from him because God the Father cannot look at sin, it wasn't because of Jesus' sin that that happened. He was forsaken by the presence of the Father because of me, and I'm just going ahead and throw you in the lot because it's true, yeah. and because of you. Yeah. And he took that for us. In that moment, he was all alone. I, I got good news for you this morning. You don't ever have to be all alone. I need you to know that. You do not have to be alone. The devil is a liar. Yes. He's been trying to convince you that you're alone. And whenever you don't feel the presence of the Lord, whenever the enemy comes and whispers in your ear and tells you that it's hopeless and you try to find another way to solace your pain, the devil is a liar. I'm here yes. to tell you right now, you do not have to be alone. Jesus took yes. that for you. Yes. Praise God. He's one whisper away, my friend. And if you'll run towards him. As he draws you, because he's been drawing That's you. Right. He's been drawing you by his presence, That's but you right. might have been running in the other direction. But if you'll make an about face and run back towards him, I'm telling you right now, he'll clench you in his arms with those nail scarred hands, and he'll love on you like you ain't never been loved on before. Thank you, Jesus. 
You, you know, Jesus, as he bleeds there, as he bleeds naked, as the world mocks him, look at you. You said you could rebuild the temple in three days. You can't even save yourself. And they're sitting there laughing. And the world's mocking, wagging their head. The disciples are running. Everything's chaotic. And what does Jesus do in the midst of all that? The same thing Jesus always does. Today you will be with me in paradise, my friend. He saves another soul. And then he does what he wants me to do. Luke 6, 27 through 28. I say unto you which hear, which hear. I say unto you which hear. Here, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. That's my Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. From a heart, a broken heart, and he was all alone. He, he just, he's sitting there, and the, and the world's sin is upon him. And, and what does he say? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. I put it in blue right here. And half of us can't even love our own brothers and sisters. No, really. The Lord has asked you and I to pray for those that despitefully use us. And we have a hard time loving our own brothers and sisters. How are they going to know that we're disciples whenever the love of God is not being reflected in and out of our lives? And listen to me. You can say, yeah, but but I, but I they, they didn't love me first. What does that matter? No, I'm trying to set you free this morning. I'm trying to help you get set free. If you are expecting other human beings to do the right thing, you're on the wrong planet. <laughs> and you are in the wrong church. And good luck finding the right church if you think being in a church is not going to get your feelings hurt. I wish, I wish that we'd all grow up and learn how to not hurt our brothers and sisters. That would be a beautiful thing. Yes. Help us, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let me let you in on a secret. If you don't understand how the Holy Spirit works in crucifying your flesh, then the fruit of the Spirit cannot be pro produced in your life. And, and what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that when I'm talking about the cross, there's two levels to the cross. Number one, when Jesus died there, he, forgave, he, he purchased forgiveness of your sin. But you got to live there. You got to live there. And listen, if you're not reading the scripture and all you're doing, I'm not talking about reading the scripture from a works based mindset. That's not what I'm talking about. But if you're not reading the scripture to learn the heart of the Lord, why would you not read the scripture? I mean, I had a good conversation with my friend when well, me and John were talking a while back. He's like, man, if you think about it in the New Testament, the believers didn't even have the word of God. And he's right. They, like, if they wanted to hear the Old Testament written, they had to go to the synagogue. They did not carry around a Bible in their back pocket. That's right. That's right. And the Holy Spirit was moving on their hearts, amen, and changing their lives. But, but I just got a question. If you have access to this book, and I mean, I would imagine most of y'all got about two of them in the house. Why? How do we expect to know the love of our, of our Savior and, and the way that he responded to things if we're never actually in the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to deal with our hearts and to deal with our lives? Right. And instead, most of the time, what we're doing is we're letting the world... Pour its ways into our heart. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I think y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes. So when we place our faith daily in what the Lord has done, let it be understood that there's a release of grace and it's the grace of the Holy Spirit that's doing the work. You can't, man, Lord help us. It's not about, an, you know, I was listening to one preacher and he was talking about you know, one person he might have one person might have a problem with pornography, and it's a demon spirit that needs to be cast out of them. And the other person just needs a little accountability. For That's them. right. Yeah. <laughs> look, I mean, look, this is the thing. It just needs a little self control. You ain't getting that from no other human being. Amen. Ain't no other human being gonna help you be accountable to the yeah. Holy Ghost. No, you get. You need to understand the difference between crucifying the flesh. 
I'm probably going to preach on some of this Wednesday night. But look, the enemy is trying to provoke your flesh, the fallen nature that you have and tempt you to move towards things that are unholy. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to have a relationship with that lying demonic spirit. You can, when you start to realize the tempter is coming, all you got to do is let your flesh be crucified. You got to understand who you are in Christ. You have a new identity. The word of God says that you are a new creation in Christ. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that old things have passed away and that all things have become new? Do you believe that what Jesus did at the cross was enough? And if you didn't know it to believe it yet, today I'm trying to tell you that that simple faith in Christ. Yes. Yeah, I meant to say this the other day, and I didn't a while back. Out of that, out of that, first, that first Corinthians, I believe it's first Corinthians 11, 3, I believe it is. Where it says that the serpent, I'm, I'm concerned that through his subtlety like the serpent deceived Eve, you too may be led astray from your simple and pure devotion to Christ Jesus. The simplicity that is in Christ. And you know, for a long time, that's a rap I've taken. You're like, dude, you don't, you don't preach a simple gospel. Yeah. Let me tell you something. That word right there is not talking about presenting Jesus at a third grade level. That's not even what that word means. That word means singleness of focus. It means to keep your eyes on Christ and what Christ has done. It means that your hope is in him and him yes. alone. It means it's not Jesus and something else. It means it's Jesus and nothing else. It means that you're going to hold on to the hem of his garment. That no matter what you're going through, you're going to let him pour his strength into you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to tell you that that's what the Word of God says. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote over and over and over again to, to teach Christians what true victory looks like and how they can access it. Amen. You know, when you keep your faith focused in the Lord, He's going he's gonna to give you the help that you need. He's going to give you the victory over the enemy. But if you don't do that, listen to me, Christian. <laughs> this is important that you hear this. Because I'm not gonna, I'm not preaching in such a way that I'm just trying to get you to come back next week. I mean, I hope you do come back next week. But but what I but what I want to tell you is this is that if we do not learn how to yield to the will of God according to the word of God, if we do not learn how to yield to what Christ has done for us and let the Holy Spirit form. Christ in us. Yes. We are going to stand before the Lord one day. And we're going to give an account uh, uh, for how we handle God's word. And, 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 and we will have to give an account for why we did not let Christ be formed in us. I can't, I can't say it enough times in enough different ways. I grew up in a church when I first got saved back in the day. There was a lot of works-based Christianity. And good preachers back then, and I'm telling you, they were the best preachers we had, would call sin out. Okay, but then they would tell you, and this is all the things you got to do in order to get free. That don't work. That's not, it's not about what you did. It's all about what he did Amen. and your faith and trust in that and the power of God moving through that. All right. Praise God. So a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. So my first point, again, was the first thing that sticks out is that the love of God revealed through Jesus shows me he just kept on loving. <laughs> that no matter what people did to him, no matter how they rejected him, no matter how they offended him, no matter how they treated him, he just kept on loving. The second thing that I've noticed about the love of the Lord uh, is how is about his heart. It's really more of a question that I'm asking you because the Lord's asked me this question before. How does his heart feel in the midst of all this? And, and, th and this is the part where that word that was given, I believe, is directly connected to this. How does Jesus' heart feel in the midst of your life and in my life, in the church, based upon the condition of the church? How does the heart of our Lord feel in the midst of all that? I wrote a little something here, like a lovesick husband. I put lovesick because he's relentless. He never gives up. 
He keeps on pursuing his bride. It doesn't even matter that sometimes she doesn't want to be caught. He keeps pursuing her. And it's like he's a lovesick husband. And he, he says, it doesn't matter that you don't even want me. I purchased you and you belong to me. And I am going to chase after you. Every page you turn through in this book, he's pursuing the love of his life. He is in pursuit of, of his love. And so many times when you turn the pages of this story saga, you find his arms empty. His bride is elusive. He calls, but she does not respond. He loves, but she does not reciprocate. But he tries harder and harder and he refuses to give up. And so much so that sometimes she seems to pretend it's a game. Oh, yeah. Sometimes his, his bride will pretend it's a game. Now I was probably wondering why this was under the keyboard. She'll pretend it's a game. It's like, here I am, Lord. Catch me. Catch me, Lord. Because see, what she learns is that even though she runs away, he'll, he'll pursue her. And you and I both know that there's been times in our life that we've done that. That even though we know that he's pursuing us, even though we know that he's calling us, we'll run in the other direction. And then sometimes we'll get way over here and we'll be like, well, I don't feel his presence as much as I used to. Let me come back. Let me come back over here get a little bit closer. And I'm not saying that we're mechanically like actually thinking about this, but this is kind of like what we do. And we're like, here, oh, there he is. I can feel him again. And then like a runaway bride, <laughs> she just runs off again. And she's like, chase me, Lord. Chase me. And the Lord's saying to his church this morning, it's evident, that I have been pursuing my bride. I've been pursuing my bride, but yet she turns from me. I keep loving her. I keep drawing her by my presence, and I keep speaking to her. But she keeps turning, and she keeps going in another direction. And the good news is this, is that if you're in this house this morning, and you are responding to his pursuit, then you don't even feel bad right now. But if you're in this house this morning, and the Lord's been calling you, and you keep on running from him, you should feel convicted in your heart, and you should understand how much Jesus loves loved you and you need to understand that he died on the cross for you and you need to understand that he proved his love to you and that he just wants you to come to him and that he's going to make things better he's going to heal you he's going to minister you he's going to strengthen you he's going to give you hope sometimes we walk around here and we feel like we're hopeless and, and the reality of it is it's because we're running in another direction That's good. we're running after other lovers yes. Lord help us He's so different than we are. Amen. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Aren't you glad that the Lord is so yeah. different than we are? Yes. Praise God. He loves us even when we cheat. Even when we reduce him to last on our list. He pursues us until the day that we will read and it enters our heart. Do you despise the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Isn't it a beautiful thing whenever that truth comes to roost in our hearts? <laughs> that, and that is so true, is it not, that the goodness of God leads us to... And, and a big part of that is a lot of times whenever we've been running, we've been running from His presence, but He still pursues us. And then finally one day we're like, you know what, Lord? I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve this. And the Holy Spirit overwhelms our heart. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When the Holy Spirit comes in and melts our heart. And we realize that how much he loved us, even though we were running from him. I don't know about you, but I've felt that so many times. I've been feeling that recently. I'm just like, Lord, you are so good. You love me in spite of me. Thank you, Lord, that you're not like me. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. I can't shake it out of my ears. You know, that, that, that word, what about his heart? Because it was many years ago I was praying and he said, I felt, I know that the Holy Spirit spoke this to me. And, and I've told y'all kind of like this before, but it was bigger than just what I need. It was, I, but I was praying and I was, you know, a lot of times we pray about our needs and there's nothing wrong with us praying about our needs. The Lord wants to hear what, 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 what we have need of. But, but at that point, I could have just been offended by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he said, but what about me? What about me, son? What about my heart? What about what I'm? Why, why don't my people ever ask that? You know, what do you want, Lord? 
What do you want from me? Because I'm over here asking you all the time. Give, 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 give me, give to me, oh Lord. But, but what about me, son? I have some wants. I have some things that, that I desire, amen? And those, ring, those words ring in my ears. And even after hearing those words, I have done the same thing. Here I am, Lord. Come get me. Come find me. I'm running in the opposite direction of you, but I expect you to be right there. And can I tell you that he is? Can I tell you that he doesn't stop doing what he's doing? He told that thief on that cross. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. He does not stop doing what he does. It's us. That stop doing what we're supposed to do. And I'm telling you right now, all it takes is one moment of time to get our heart right. And he'll be right there to lavish us with his love again. When I slow down long enough to think about my own life and his goodness, I can't help but say to him, why are you that good, Lord? I believe God wants his people to know how his heart feels. And that's why I believe that he's speaking this word this morning. I believe that that's why he spoke that word already. I believe that the Lord wants his bride to know. You know, you're, you're a local church, so you get to hear it come from me. But I promise you, if you get on the right YouTube channels, you'll hear this kind of word going forth. It's going forth across the land. God's calling his people home. He's calling yes. his bride to come close yes. to his heart. Good preachers are hearing it right now. They're feeling it in their spirit, and they're speaking the truth. And, 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 and so what I want you to know is this, is that I definitely believe he wants his ministers also to know how he feels. I believe that's one of the reasons that he gave us the book of Hosea. Let's turn to Hosea chapter uh, 1, verses 2 and 3. Anybody ever read the book of Hosea before? Yeah. Yeah. A really powerful book. The first two to three chapters are just really kind of amazing. Let me give you a little bit of a background info on the book itself. Is that Hosea is a prophet in Israel. And that the Lord, we're going to read it here in a second, that the Lord tells him to go wife, to go marry a woman that's, that's a, a woman, a wife of whoredoms, is what the King James says. And I want you to have children from a wife of whoredoms. And so this is, what the prophet, this is what the Lord told the prophet, and starting in verse 2, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms, for the land has committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. She ends up having three children for him. She has a son named Jezreel, which means to sow. She has a daughter named Loruhuma, which means no mercy. And the verse where it talked about it is in verse 6. It says, For I will have no more mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. And then in verse 9, he has a daughter named, she gives him a daughter named Loamai. And this is what it says. Her name means, not my people. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. And, and you know, that's one of the things that really breaks my heart about the Lord is that so oftentimes when I speak to people in the world, I realize how much they misunderstand God's love. And, and the fact of what Jesus' cross really represents is that God shows us his love and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. But there's a world that's sick out there that doesn't want to be told that their life is sinful. And instead, they just continue to plod forward towards their own will and live their own life in contradiction to the Lord. Jesus poured out his life for the world on the cross. And he gave us the spirit of grace. But one day, he's going to say, no more mercy. No more time for me to pursue you with my love. The door is closed. Entry denied, for you are not my people, because you did not make me your God. That is coming, and that is the love of God. That is an aspect of the love of God to tell people the truth, that there's coming a day when there is going to be judgment, when mercy and grace Amen. is going to run out. Amen. The good news is, is that I know you in this church love, love the Lord, and we're in the midst of a world, but listen to me, we're in the midst of the world that is so full of chaos right now. I keep telling y'all that, but you know what I'm concerned is? I'm concerned that we've been inundated with it so much that we're, that we're just becoming numb to it. Yeah. 
you know what I'm getting at? Was just becoming numb to all of the things that were being told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, preacher. You keep telling me that every week. But not only you, all the other preachers that I watch, everybody keeps saying it. It's bad. And we can see it. We see the wars, the rumors of the wars, and COVID changed everything. And we just, we just done got into this robotic position where we're just like, man, it's just bad. And, and I'm going to try to encourage it. I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to beat you up when I ask you this question. And I don't want you to answer me. But I am going to ask a question. Are, you, are, you, are we in prayer? Are we in prayer not just for our own life and us four and no more? But are we, have we tapped into the heart of God? And are we asking the Lord to move upon the earth and to wake up his bride? And to, and to remove the spirit of complacency that is on the church. Is that the heart, is that your cry of your heart? Are, you, are we taking time to do that? Or are we so busy with our life? Listen, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit wants to know. Are we taking the time to spend some time in prayer to ask the Lord to be merciful to our brothers and sisters that might not be, have not learned how to walk in victory yet. To, for, for people that find themselves bound up. Uh, and, and for the lost of the world, or are we so consumed with the American dream? Somebody help me. Are we so consumed with the American dream? And my, my next job, my next paycheck, my, my, my business, my, my next nice new car, my next house that I want to buy, my upgrade that I want. My, my, you know, what are we so consumed with our daily activity that we've forgotten the heartbeat of the Lord that's saying people are perishing? People, listen, the story's either real or it's not. And people, and I believe this story. People are plunging into a devil's hell every day. And, and the problem is, is that where is our heart? Now, I, I don't know what you do during the day. And I, I'm not, I don't know. Maybe you're seeking the Lord. Maybe your heart is soft and you're, and you're joining with God. And you're, and you're asking the Lord to have his way on the earth. I don't know. But listen, there's going to be a day when we're going to stand before him. And I promise you something. We're going to wish we would have prayed more. We're going to wish that we would have loved more. We're going to wish that we would have told one more person. One more person like Jesus. Jesus is our example. He told that thief on the cross when he's, when he's beat up and when he's broken. And when his heart's broken because everybody treated him wrong. And he, and he, he led that man he promised that man that he'd have eternal life. Yes. And he went, he went to the grave on this side praying. Praying the Father's will. That people would be forgiven even whenever they're wrong. And I'm here to tell you that this is, this is real. No, this is real stuff right here, my friend. I don't know what, what other people are talking about. Uh, but this is real stuff. God wants his people called by his name to be provoked. God wants his people called by his name to be stirred up. Amen. And, and, and he said, my father's house will be a house of prayer. He, he wants his people to pray. I'm not trying to beat you down about your prayer life. That's between you and the Lord. I'm trying to make a point. The people of God pray. The people of God are concerned about lost souls. The people of God are concerned about their brothers and sisters. The people of God are concerned about the things of God. They're not allowing themselves to be overwhelmed by the things of the world. They're not allowing themselves to be overwhelmed and to carry around a spirit of rejection and the spirit of the fifth because Jesus paid a high price so that you wouldn't have to do that. He loves you. He loves me. So she had three children for him. There's coming a day when there's not going to be any more mercy. You know, I was thinking, this is what the Lord's heart is to Hosea. Go take yourself a wife that will cheat on you, Hosea, because I need a prophet to feel what I feel. <laughs> Go get yourself a wife that's going to cheat on you, Hosea, because I need a prophet that's going to feel what I feel because I need a mouth to speak my heart to a people that keep breaking. Jesus. The Lord wants a mouth to speak to a people about his heart because they keep on breaking it. And the Holy Spirit would speak to us this morning and he would say, Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You will find rest for your weary soul. He wants you to, he wants you to learn about the love of God. Listen, where do I start, preacher? How about we just start by being real with God? 
being real with God, I mean, every preacher wants the altars to be filled. I don't really care if you come to the altar. I really don't. What I care about is that you make an altar in your heart. Come on. I care yes. that you get prostrated yes. in your heart before the yes. Lord. And that you get real with Him. And that you talk to Him. Amen. And that you let Him have His way with you. And you say, Lord, I need more. I want to, I want to serve you. Please give me the grace and the strength that I need. Lord, help me. And, and, and resist the devil and submit yourself to God and watch the devil flee from you. Because you have authority and you have victory. You have victory upon this earth. Jesus paid a high price for your victories. That I have given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Demonic spirits do not have power over the child of God. Are you born again this morning? Amen. If you're not born again, you need to invite Jesus into your heart right now. Hallelujah. You need to let the Holy Spirit have his way in your heart. You need to say, come in, Lord, and forgive me of my sin. And have your way with me, Lord. Have your way with me. Invite him into your heart. Ask forgiveness of your sin. Say, I need you, Jesus. I need you. And listen, whenever you get born again, the Holy Spirit's going to move in. He's going to start changing things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Preachers just supposed to talk about it. I can't change it. Amen. I can pray for you. I'm praying. I've been praying. Lord, touch them. Touch your people. So listen. He goes and he buys. He goes and buys. No, I'm sorry. He goes and he marries this woman named Gomer. She has three children for him. And then now look. If we fast forward to chapter 3. We'll read Hosea chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. It says this. Then said the Lord. Go yet. Love a woman beloved of her friend and adulteress according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. So he's saying, so basically what's happened is he married her, she had children for him, and then she went back to doing what she does. Okay. And he's saying, I want you to go get that woman, okay, and, and, and she's an adulteress. And I want you to do this according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. Wow. Now think about that. The Lord is saying, I need you to do with her what I keep doing for my people. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that's still the story today, my friend. Amen. You know, I want you to know that. I, and sometimes people feel so bad, so beat up because of the things that they've done. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm getting at? They feel so bad and so beat up because of the things that they've done that they walk around under a burden of condemnation. And I'm here to tell you, it's not God's will for you to walk around under a condom, uh, under a cloud of condemnation. But if, let me tell you something. If you keep rebelliously living in blatant sin, you are going to feel the condemnation of the Lord. And if you do not, your conscience is likely seared. And you really, really, really need to be crying out to the Lord and asking God to change. Like, if, listen to me this morning. If you know that you are living in blatant sin and rebellion against the Holy Spirit and you don't even feel bad about it anymore, you need to make an altar in your heart and you need to plead with God to have his way with you so that his spirit will start to work in you and work for you. I want to encourage you to do that. Yes. I want to encourage you to do that. Amen. Amen. Now for the rest of you, hallelujah, the Lord set you free. Amen. <laughs> and for those of you that you still feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, that's a good sign. And now by the grace of God, we'll start yielding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we start yielding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, He's going to be bringing us victory in our lives. Amen. He's going to bring the life of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So look what it says. It says, Then said the Lord to me, Go get a, lo a, lo a get, get a love, a woman, beloved of her friend. She's an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. Because look what they're doing. They're looking to other gods. I mean, I could preach on that for 20 minutes. Do, do we have gods in our life other than the Lord? Okay, I'm just going to leave that alone. And they love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and a homer and a half of barley. Now, if you do the calculation, most scholars agree, a homer and a half of barley is another 15 shekels. So if you take 15 plus 15, it equals 30. And, and so 30 pieces of silver is the amount of cost to, buy back, to pay for a slave. 
According to Exodus, if, 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 if some man accidentally killed another man's slave in the Old Testament, you had to redeem it with 30 pieces of silver. Now, is that not interesting also to know that, that in the eyes of the Pharisees, Jesus' worth yep. was 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Wow. Yet God's idea of what your worth is, is the life of Jesus. So uh, Hosea purchases his wife for 30 pieces of silver, if you will. And Jesus purchases his bride with his life, okay, which the Pharisees equated to 30 pieces of silver. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Lord. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. Thank you. Look in Matthew 20, verse 28, because you see, the idea was that she had fallen back into sin and that she was now a slave. So she had, so sin and disobedience and rebellion had brought her into slavery and she had to be bought out of slavery. Amen. And so Jesus said this, and you've heard me quote this passage a lot, Matthew 20, verse 28, the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That word ransom right there, it means the price for redeeming slaves and captives. What Jesus did is he basically exactly what God asked Hosea to do. He purchased his bride off the slave market of sin and the redemption price was his own life. Lord, help us. And, and so two things, I'm going to close with two different scriptures real quick. Number one, out of Galatians 5.22, I think that we've seen this, that God's love is long-suffering. Amen. God, the fruit of the Spirit, that, that the love of Christ is long suffering. Amen. It means that He has patience. He has patience with you. He has patience with me. The love of Jesus is very patient. And He's, he's waiting for us. But the, the last thing that I want to tell you comes out of 1 John chapter 3. Can you put that up there for me, please? 1 John chapter 3, verses, really just verse 1 is good. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. That word manner right there, I, I used to always explain to y'all that it, that it means from like another country or another tribe, right? Because it's foreign. God's love is foreign to this realm that you and I were born into. This realm, this earthly realm that's full of heartache and pain and where love is all twisted and the definition of love doesn't really line up with God's love. But look, the most, the most literal translation of this word, the word is patapos. The first part is poke, which would mean wind, and pos. Which would mean where? Where? When and where? <laughs> when and where did this stuff come from? Yeah, yeah, you understand what I'm trying to say? When and where did this stuff right here, the love of God, where did this stuff come from? And if you don't know what I'm talking about right now, then, then I'm gonna I believe in God that He's gonna give you a revelation of it. Because, because anybody that's in their heart been running in the opposite direction and then they done got overwhelmed almost like remember when you want to recess around and somebody kicked you from behind and next thing you know you fought. The Lord done overwhelmed you. He done pursued you. He grabbed a hold of you. When and where did this stuff come from? When the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ overwhelm you, it's like what manner of love is this? That after all I've done, after all I've cheated on you, after all I've ran from you, that you would overwhelm me and that you would bestow, pour upon me, lay upon me this kind of love, and I don't understand it. I don't know where you are in your life this morning, but I want to encourage you. As they sing this song, amen, and you think about the love of God and how God has called upon you, and you heard the truth of the word today. This is the truth of the word of God. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that through his son the world 
might be saved. You can give your heart to the Lord this morning. Listen, if you feel the Holy Spirit ministering to your heart, I want you to come up here so we can pray with you. Praise God. Let's close this service out with giving glory to our King. Amen. Let's stand up and worship.